Thank you, Joe. It's a blessing to have you with us here today. An unfertilized human egg cell measures 0 .004 of an inch, 0 .004 of an inch. Aurora Satoshi was the largest sumo wrestler ever to live. He was 656 pounds in his prime. But Aurora Satoshi began as an egg cell that measured 0 .004 inches. Big things from small things come. If you had a sequoia seed in your hand and you breathed out, it would blow it out of your hand. It's so small and lightweight. And yet the tallest tree in the world is called General Sherman. I didn't know they named trees, but evidently they do. 250 feet, it goes straight up in the sky. It's a giant sequoia. But General Sherman began as a seed that was so small and lightweight that if you exhaled, you'd blow it right out onto the dirt because big things from small things come. Every major movement, civil rights, anti-war, the women's movement, they all, they all had songs sung by the great singers of the protest movement from Bob Dylan to Joan Baez to Nina Simone to Sammy Davis Jr. to Bruce Springsteen. Uh, they all had a common theme. They all have songs that in one way or the other start off by saying uh, big things from small things come. Say it with me. Big things from small things come. The major achievers of this world, they built it on a similar concept. Uh, there's a Chinese proverb that you'll hear all the time woven into motivational speeches, and it goes like this. A journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You ever heard that? Yeah. Steve Jobs used it to try to motivate Apple employees. Mary Kay was fond of using that to try to get her cosmetic salespeople out there and get that pink Cadillac. All sorts of other folks have used it. John F. Kennedy quoted it to awaken a sleeping nation. Martin Luther King modified it. He said, you don't have to see the end of a staircase to take the first step. Neil Armstrong, when he stepped down on that moon, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All of them basically saying the same thing, that every kind of major movement and every kind of uh, major accomplishment has to begin with a small movement, a small step. Because big things from small things come. But the people in the day of Haggai and Zechariah, these prophets we're looking at, they didn't buy it. Uh, they were very depressed and demoralized when they saw that the temple foundation was uh, put down again after they returned from exile in about 400 B.C. They had built the foundation there out of stones, and they looked at it, and they said, oh, this is not going to be anything like what we remember. Oh, this is such a disappointing looking thing here we have. We're never going to be like we once were. We're too far down. It's never going to be the same anymore. Small things from small things come. And it was into that attitude, that way of thinking, that Zechariah and Haggai had to try to rally the troops, had to try to inspire people to see the future differently than they were seeing it. And so they went into Jerusalem with the people trying to regather and figure out what had happened to them and figure out what they were going to do next. And they preached these sermons like God is still with us and there's the future that is brighter than the past and they would, would call that into being. And then they had to find some people, some leaders who would buy into that message and work hard to get the community of faith rebuilt. They first found a religious leader. His name was Joshua. We read about him last week. He really wasn't qualified. He had a lot wrong. He had done a lot wrong. He was deeply flawed. And yet, 
Zechariah came to him and says, God's calling you, buddy. You got to step up and become the high priest. I know you don't know anything about how to do it, but this is your calling. This is your moment. Come on. And Joshua said, all right. And then God gave Joshua a vision. He said, this time, build the community as a city without walls. Bring everybody in. Create villages everywhere and bring them together to serve and worship the living God. And Joshua went to work. But they needed a political leader as well. They needed a government leader as well. They had the religious community leader. And so they looked around and they prayed and they discerned the one we're supposed to anoint has a hard name. I tell you what, I've never met a single kid named this name, Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, those of you who still have your children in the future, I'd recommend you consider that name. Zerubbabel. It's hard to say, it's hard to preach, (laughs) Uh, but they chose Zerubbabel. He was a descendant of King David, but he was as inept as Joshua. He had lived his whole life in captivity too. Now, if you've got a nation under your claw, if you've got them as your servants, you're not not going to teach them military strategy. You're not going to equip them with fighting ability because you don't want them creating a revolution. So uh, Zerubbabel had no military training. He didn't know the first thing about warfare. He couldn't wield a sword. He couldn't build a catapult. He couldn't drive a chariot. He didn't know any of this. He didn't know a single thing. And even if he had, he had no army because all the people that were returning to Jerusalem after exile had been raised in captivity. They, too, had not had any military training or advanced direction. And even if he had an army, he didn't have any weapons. The weapons didn't come back to Jerusalem until Nehemiah. They sent Nehemiah with a few weapons to fight off the people who tried to stop him from rebuilding the wall. But they didn't have any when Zerubbabel is called into action. And even if they had had some weapons, it had taken him a long time to train whoever was willing to fight and to enforce and to defend the nation. You talk about small things. The nation of Israel was about as small as you can get in the days after exile. But they call him. They say, you got to come on. And in, to inspire him, God gives Zechariah a vision that he tells to Zerubbabel. And it's a complicated vision. I'm not going to play it down. But I, I can't describe it to you precisely. But I can give you a general idea. Picture a big golden bowl, like a wedding punch bowl. Are you all with me so far? Yeah, okay. A wedding punch bowl. Uh, at our wedding, they had the wedding punch bowl for everybody, and then they had my mother's own wedding punch bowl. <laughs> it said for my mother, who had no interest in any kind of alcohol of any kind. So they gave her a safe punch bowl. And so you think of that big wedding punch bowl there. It's on an impressive lamp stand made of gold. And then there are two olive trees on either side of that big wedding punch bowl, that big golden bowl. The golden bowl picture it brimming with olive oil and every once in a while you know if there's a little shake it spills over it's just brimming with olive oil if you ever bought olive oil you know how expensive that would be right so it's got all this stuff now there's two tubes coming out of the olive trees into the bowl and it just refills the bowl with oil over and over again and out of the bowl there are seven pipes going into seven lamps that have the little lip like Aladdin's lamp, and they're going into those lamps, and they're burning. they got flames coming out of them. They're to light. So you got this bowl, you got the olive oil coming in, you got it going out to the lamps, and the whole configuration was meant to say, God is going to supply us with everything we need to be a shining light in the world once again. All God needs is for a few people to step up and say, I'll work, I'll lead, I'll believe, and this is going to come to pass. And and, and it's Zerubbabel to know, Zerubbabel, what God's asking you to do to rebuild the faith community, it's not going to happen by your military might. Don't worry about it. You can't do that anyway. It's not going to happen by your force of personality or by strong arm tactics. 
God's going to rebuild the community by the Spirit of God, which is like that olive oil that will just keep rolling in and rolling in and supplying you with everything you need. You're never going to run out. It's never going to end. The trees won't die. God's going to be with you to do this. And when we hear that God's going to do it, magical thinking makes us think, well, then it should happen in just a heartbeat, right? God should be able to snap celestial fingers, boom, and the community is rebuilt. That'd be nice. You know, like, like God delivered the people from slavery when they were in Egypt, you know. That just, wait a minute, that's not a good example. I don't know why I thought of that. They were in slavery 400 years. It took the plagues. <laughs> it took a whole mess of stuff, you know, and the, uh, Pharaoh's fickle mind, and they got out, and you know, it took forever. I meant to say, like Moses leading the people of children, the children of Israel through the wilderness. Now, that was, uh, man, I must have been off my game when I wrote this sermon because now that I think about it, uh, they were out there in the wilderness 40 years, and then there were 40 years added to it. It was a mess of a time. That thing took forever. Oh, here's one. Like David, when David built the kingdom. That happened so quickly. Now that I go back over that, actually, I apologize to y'all. I'm leading you down the wrong way every time, aren't I? Because he was 12 years old about when he got anointed for the first time. Then he had to do that business with Goliath. And then it took him a long time to recruit the men of valor. And they had to go in and he had to fight Saul. Remember, he dodged Saul forever. And it took him 30 years to get the kingdom. And then uh, his family disrespected him. Enemies undid him. He lost the throne once. He had to go back. And, oh, boy. I don't know. Let me think of it, if I could pause here, if I wasn't under so much pressure, I think I could, Jesus, there you go, Jesus, the Messiah. Should be applause just rippling forth now that I have come up with this illustration. But as I get deep into this thought, now Joe, help me out here. Uh, the Messiah was first predicted 2,000 years before he showed up. Then he's born as a baby. They got to protect him, get him by Herod. Got to get him. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God. And, and then he got, had to call the disciples. And then there, his mother, his own mother, tried to shut him down. And then the, the religious establishment went on. And then he got, oh, he had to go to the cross. Well, here's what I have learned in this sermon so far God is faithful. But God is not quick. God is faithful. But God is not quick. So it's going to take some time to rebuild this community. He's trying to inspire them. They need something to hold on to. They need some vision. God seems to know this is going to be a huge challenge. He says, when you all think of doing this, rebuilding the community, you picture a, a mountain. There's a huge mountain where the temple ought to be. But he says, I'm going to raise up Zerubbabel. I'm going to give the man the power of the Holy Spirit. He's going to level that place, and, and that mountain's going to be gone. And then he says, I, I, he's going to rebuild. And to prove it, we're going to have a ceremony. So the whole city of Jerusalem is called together. And God tells Zerubbabel, I want you to bring in the capstone of the temple and put it right in the middle of the community. Now, he couldn't have carried that in. He must have had a cart or something. I don't know. But they got that thing in there. Now, remi remember, there's no temple there. You understand? There's no temple there. It's just a, a flat foundation. But they bring the final stone, the stone that's going to go in the temple when it's all finished, when everything is rebuilt. They bring that stone, and they put it right in the middle of the assembly. And then God tells the whole congregation to cry out, grace to us, grace to us, blessing upon blessing. Oh, my goodness, we can see it. And then Zerubbabel, I mean, you know, they had to think he had lost a marble or two because Zerubbabel is going around the city with a plummet line, a measuring line, and he's going, well, I think the first wall, go right here, up to, I see it, yeah, it's going to go over here, and then this, and back here we'll have the altars, or, you know, measure that out, hey, go over there and stand, let's see how far, they're going, buddy, there is nothing here, <laughs> do you understand, there's nothing here, we have no resources, there's nothing with which to build, what are you doing, he says, I'm seeing a vision, 
I'm seeing a vision when it's all rebuilt and the capstone is here and all of God's people come together and they're worshiping and they're thriving and they're singing and they're sharing and they're filled with mercy and justice and compassion and they're a shining light into the world. I see it. And you would think that would be inspiring, wouldn't it? You know, I think some of my sermons are inspiring, but sometimes I'm sort of a small minority on that. I don't seem to be able to really, you know, connect sometimes. You ever, you ever try to inspire your family? Okay, get back there and study and do that homework and go out there and play and get your thing to, you know, and they go, yeah. He's got this wonderful vision of the capstone and the plummet line and the, and the people shouting. I mean, it's rocking and rolling. But there were some people, evidently, who said, this ain't going to work. Because Zechariah had to say to them, no one should despise the day of small beginnings. <laughs> I love that. I think that ought to be on a banner out in our foyer. Can you hear that word for us today? No one should despise the day of small beginnings. Why? Because big things from small things come. Amen to that. I'll amen my own sermon. We ought to carve it on this pulpit so you see it all with gold inlay. No one should despise the day of small beginnings. Ha. It's got to start somewhere. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Big things from small things come. We've got to hear the word of the Lord today. Ah, oh, we need to hear it. Church attendance was falling nationwide before the pandemic. Gallup poll did a survey in 2019, said that in the 20th century, the apex of church attendance was 1937. Any, we won't ask if anybody here was alive in that day. 1937. That's when he hit the top. 70% of all Americans were going to church or to synagogue in 1937. What was going on? Do you remember, you're, you historians, uh, you, you're in the great, well, you're not, you're before the war, you're, you're in the depression, okay? And everybody's trying to, well, we better get some help from God. This is bad news. Uh, it, it dropped to 68% during the war years, but it stayed at around 68% of the American population going to church or synagogue until 1990. 68% of the country until 1990, which happens to be about when I became your pastor. I don't think the two things are correlated. I hope to God they are. Uh, but in 1990, church attendance nationwide began to drop. And in 2019, it hit a new low for the 2021st century, the two centuries. It dropped to 48%. First time in the last two centuries when church attendance dropped below 50%. 48% of the country now goes. Now, in, in, that's all before the pandemic, when the pandemic is hit now. If you lived in the South or the Midwest, church attendance is down 20% from that. If you live out where we do or on the West Coast, church attendance is down 60% in those churches, like ours. Look around, do you see any vacant pews? <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Uh, but it's not the first time. You know, despite all of our nostalgic thinking, Martin Marty, a renowned church historian, documented that during colonial America, 1776, only 17% of the population in the United States went to church. They were working all the time, mainly. Only 17%. Does that surprise you? Surprise me. Yeah. Uh, and by 1850, it was up to 36%, but then the Civil War hit, and it dropped back down, and, and then it would rise up when abolition, or first when prohibition came in, churches filled up again, and then it dropped, and then when abolition came in, the things started moving again, and things dropped, and it went on and on like that, where, where the history of the Church of Jesus Christ looks like this. You get a swell in attendance, and you get a drop. You get a swell, and then you get a drop. We have a greater challenges here because uh, the Pew Research Group did some research in uh, 2014. They said uh, that the state of the union where more people go to church percentage-wise than any other is Alabama. 
58% of the population goes to church on a Sunday in Alabama. We're, the state of Maryland, we're at number 37. <laughs> That's down the list. Only 13 states have worse church attendance than, or synagogue attendance than we do. 31% of our population goes to church. So we got a small beginning, don't we? We're at a small thing here, aren't we? What are we going to do about that? We're going to depend on the power and the might of the Spirit of God is what we're going to do. And we're going to try to find leadership to rise up and to do this. And to, you're going to have some sort of people that you're going to think they're a little bit weird. They're out measuring stuff. Well, I think the sanctuary will go this way and we'll go this way. And we'll, <laughs> come on, what are you talking about? Uh, and we're going to have a capstone and say there's a future here and we can see it. And it's going to be slow and it's going to take work. But there's a better day coming. In 1805, I don't think any of you were around that day, but in 1805, a small group of people started the church at the Navy Yard. That's what they called it. It was people from First Baptist Church, which could have just as well been called the Baptist Church. There weren't any others. It was the First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. A small group went out to the Navy Yard and said, I think we need more than one Baptist Church in this city, and I think God's calling us to build one right here. It was about 15 people set in a room and they started having worship out there at the Navy Yard and the first convert was a freed slave. That's right. The Church of the Navy Yard is our root church and from the very beginning this church was a diverse congregation. A freed slave was the first one to be baptized into the membership. And that continued, a little bit of growth, until after the War of 1812 and when slavery was now be being debated all over the country and there was all sorts of violence and problems, then all the white folks got into one church and all the black folks got into other churches and you didn't have any diverse congregations. Uh, when we were first married, I was invited to preach at the First Baptist Church of Washington, D.C. And Karen looked it up somewhere, First Baptist Church, and she went and she got there and the parking lot was empty. She thought, that's a little weird. I mean, I know he's not much of a preacher, but I mean, somebody should have come. And, and she went up and rang the doorbell, and somebody came out, and she said, I, where's the big convention? <laughs> my, my husband's preaching here. And the man said, I think you're at the wrong First Baptist Church. It was an African-American church. There were two First Baptist churches, still are today. She got her directions and got over there and heard a sermon that probably changed her life. I don't really remember now. <laughs> the point being, the church is split, but the church of the Navy Yard began to grow and grow, and it took on the name of the Second Baptist Church of Washington, D.C., and it grew and it grew and it grew, and it became a big, thriving church, and then in the 1960s, it was unable to really reach the changing neighborhoods. The neighborhoods were becoming African-American in the inner city, and they didn't know how to do that. And so all of a sudden, there was a decline and decline and decline. Same thing was happening at the Avondale Baptist Church in, in Washington, D.C. Same thing was happening at the Brookland Baptist Church. Uh, they were all going through the same thing. So groups of all of them came out here. And in, by 1970, they officially, they were here long before that, but in 1970, they officially christened the University Baptist Church. And here we go. And all those three churches, the pews were filled, the Sunday school was filled, they had a youth choir, they had everything rocking and rolling and going and going and going. And then over time, the inability of the church to reach its community took its toll. And then we came with the new vision that we're going to build a church of people from all nations and, and races. And we started doing that. And the church grew and the church and the grew and it, and it grew. And then distraction and disappointment and now disease battered the membership to where it became small once again. And it would be easy for any of us to despise the day of small things. But that's not what this message is about. This message is to call you to hear the word of Zechariah. That the Holy Spirit is like olive oil that just keeps coming into us and filling us and making us stronger and shining a light in this community. And we are in the days of small beginnings once again. We are in the days of the first step of maybe a thousand miles. But I promise you this. 
there will be a day in the not too distant future when somebody's going to drag a capstone in here <laughs> and they're going to put it right in the middle of here and they're going to say we have a vision now for a new building and we have a power for a new community and this place is going to come alive again by not by might not by talent not by force of personality but by the spirit of god Amen, amen. and amen.